What are you guys listening to? Title. What about you? T- everybody's title. So no Spotify's. I do title high five. It's black. Wow. So even this, the sound guys at the hotel are streaming in high res. Good news. Oh, no. No. Oh, okay. Where are you from? Tell me about. Oh, you're with Audio Fest. No yes. wonder. Okay. And also, All right. don't, I wouldn't call it high res. Like no. Tidal Hi Fi is Red Book. Yes. And, it, and a lot, I think one of the big problems of the way that some of this stuff gets marketed because you've, there's a lot of conversation about how bad lossy compression is and how awesome genuine high res 2496, 2194192 is. And in the middle, where all the music lives is CDs and Red Book quality and why we have such an am- amazing choice on Tidal Hi-Fi, it's just CDs, right? And yet, I l- it's being re-spun as somehow high-res when it's, it's just not. It's not high-res. No, you're right. You know, like, because I think the, the, the language here is very important. You know, the <clears throat> audio file standards, if we're going to have standards, we have to make sure that we're all talking the same language. And the, those standards are described consistently across the board. So high res is anything above 1644, and lossy compression is, I don't know, Apple or um, MP3 or Og Vorbis that Spotify use. And the panel hasn't, this, we're still in the warm up act right now. He's right. <laughs> He's right. And actually, uh, the Grammy <coughs> Foundation, the Naris people, are trying to establish some standards, one being that 441, 16 kidding. bit. They have standards. <laughs> <laughs> so she's going she's to get my comic stand-up routine any minute. So anything um, technically by the Grammy people right now is 44-1, 24-bit and higher. They're trying to make it 48-24. <coughs> I Dave? think um, the CES has defined high resolution as anything... Um, better than um, CD quality. Okay, so it's 4416. There are a lot of people at this at this event who um, will say, no, 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 it's not high res unless it's 9624. You know, that's fine. You could have your own opinion, but you know, there there are definitions. Yeah. Um, so um, it's whether people but, adhere you know, to the, the, the definitions. The important thing is that um, um, we all agree that um, that you could do better than a CD. Yeah. So we all agree we can make sound better than a C. Oh, John's got a look on his face like he well, wonders. I just wanted to just vibe off what David just said. It reminded me of Neil deGrasse Tyson's famous quote, is if you can have your own opinion, but you cannot have your own facts with respect to, you know, <laughs> you know what is high res. And you're right, I think CES and CDO, I think, got together and went, right, high res yes. is, is this. And they produced that little kind of yellow logo, yellow and black logo, which you, which you see on a lot of Sony products. It's all over a Yodabashi camera in Tokyo. Like everywhere you look is that high res audio logo. But that obviously does not apply to Tidal Hi Fi. <laughs> not not that there's anything I mean, I I love that and I you know well we can get started on what I think about high res at the moment. <laughs> um but it yeah, it, it is possible to be better for sure. But availability question mark. Right. And we're gonna get to all of those questions <coughs> and more. So I'm going to start the panel right now. Um, I put on a presentation called The Six Degrees of Degradation. (coughs) Yeah, it's supposed to be funny. But I can't use that title when I speak at a professional audio show like uh, NAM or AES because they don't even understand that they're degrading the product over time. It's sad that the professional audio community hasn't adopted the same standards that are trying to be adopted by the consumer end. Professional audio community tends to be behind. So for them, I speak speak on the six stages of production, which seems to flow a little better for professional audio. Um, Today, we're going to focus a little bit more on do audiophile standards increase commercial sales, and whether or not all the hard work that we're doing in the studio to to preserve the original intention of the recording it's actually making a difference on the consumer end. And today, I'd like to uh, introduce myself, Cookie Marenko from Blue Coast Records, uh, John Darko at the end. He's going to pl- 
play the part of the consumer. <laughs> uh, and he's a writer. Well, it's, it's your online magazine, right? Yeah, I run an online magazine. Yeah, right. Yeah. Digital Audio Review. Fiona Joy over here. Uh, she's an artist with her own label, <laughs> Little Hartley Music, creating music at high standards. She works with Blue Coast Records. She also works with Will Ackerman from Windham, old Windham Hill days. And David Glasser from Airshow, one of the top mastering engineers. And <laughs> don't deny it, I've worked with uh, David we for... We go way back. We go way back, way back. And he is one of the few mastering engineers I trust that I could just send things to Dave and I don't have to think about it. It's going to come back the way I want it to sound. So at this point, I'm going to let each of them... Uh, talk a little bit about themselves, and I'm going to start with Fiona. I'm from Australia. Uh, I play the piano and I sing, and I have my, my own label, so I face a lot of these issues of how to monetize my career, um, which is very difficult at the moment because people don't pay for music, and, um, and that comes right back to this whole subject of, of working in the audiophile world because it's really the only place that we can get people to pay for our music. We've moved from an ownership model to an access model with Spotify and Tidal and all of the streaming with no real way for musicians to get paid. So as my own label owner as well as a recording artist, um, there are issues that, that I face all the time. So um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much me. I've got one album with, um, with Cookie Marenko. I'm about to record another one and uh, maybe f five albums with, um, with, that I've produced with Will Ackerman. And David Glasser can tell you a little bit about himself. Uh, I have a mastering studio called Air Show in, uh, up in Boulder. Um, and we've been at it, well, the company's been around for about 30, 33 years. Um, uh, let's see, I work with all kinds of clients, um, from uh, rank beginners working in garage band on their laptop to um, um, established artists to big labels, small labels, audiophile clients, uh, you know, and um, you know, my, my thing is just to give the client what they want and to, um, and you know, they, they come to me for what I can, can add to the, to the project. Um, but it's, um, you know, it's, it runs the, the gamut. David, t uh, talk a little bit about some of the, the um, artists that, and labels that you've worked with. Uh, let's see. Um, <clears throat> lately, the last eight years or so, um, I've been doing a lot of uh, work for the Grateful Dead. Um, um, one of the most interesting projects was remastering all of their studio albums from the original tapes for um, high-res downloads, and they're available in 24192 from HD tracks. I've um, been working with Plangen processes to um, use their wow and flutter removal system on, um, on tape transfers. Very effective, really excited about that. Uh, and on the flip side of that, um, we did a couple big projects with Jack White, um, restoring uh, 1,600 songs from the Paramount Records catalog from the uh, um, teens, 20s, and 30s uh, that were released in these big box sets. Um, much of it fairly lo-fi, but um, just fantastic music. Um, and, you know, a lot of stuff in between, a lot of regional artists. Um, Hot Tuna um, is a client, um, a lot of little boutique labels, you know, stuff like that. And John, a little about it yourself. Yeah, my name is John Darko. I, as Cookie's already said, I run a website about audio gear. Um, I try to write both for audiophiles themselves, but also would-be audiophiles, so in which case I tend to take the position of your kind of everyday man in the street, kind of cons consumer, just peeking behind the curtain. Um, I am originally British, but like Fiona, I too live in Australia. Um, but you, you live in Melbourne, right? 
Melbourne? No, I'm, I'm four hours north of Sydney. Oh, okay. But well, I think it's pretty cool that there's two of us on the yeah, same panel kind of, live in yeah, Australia. Yeah. <laughs> so I live in Sydney. Um, and I flew all the way here to Rocky Mountain just for four days and I'm going home tomorrow. So that's how much I love you guys. <laughs> yeah, that's me. And, and one of the reasons John's here is because we met at Newport Beach at the bar, doesn't everybody? And Correct. got involved. All networking is done at the bar. Yeah. And we got involved in a conversation where I just felt he was one of the more in, intelligent um, huh. writers that could ask constructive questions um, and not argumentative, but just really kind of getting to the point. I think we're actually on the same page a lot more than we often argue about, but uh, it's not even argumentative. It's really trying to get to the source of what it is. Like John mentioned earlier, these definitions and standards, which only exist if everybody adopts them and actually uses them. Um, great, so f for just a second, I'm gonna talk a little bit about provenance. Um, this is a very confusing topic. We get questions all the time from audiophiles who often think that every recording is automatically uh, mixed and mastered when it arrives. At, from the, the microphone, we're done. Plug two mics in and suddenly that's all you do. Well, there's actually a lot of processes in the, in the way from uh, the recording all the way to the end to delivery and a lot of stages where things can go wrong. And that, uh, that's a little bit of what we're gonna talk about today. As a distributor, we often get asked, why can't you put out so-and-so's record from the mid-90s in DSD? We really want it in DSD. Well, one of the issues is it was recorded in 44.1. So it's not always available in the formats we would like to release it in. And then the question becomes, do you really want to pay for a 44-1 master and then bump it up to a quad, which is, I don't know, let's just say 10 times the size. So what was it, a 700 megabyte album is suddenly 10 gigs of storage that we pay for and you pay for, and you're going to pay more money because we have to pay more money. And sonically, you're probably not going to get an improvement. Of course, there's conditions. If you've modified your entire system to only play DSD, all right, there could be reasons why you want to uh, have it in quad or double DSD or single DSD. But anyway, I find it fascinating how many people really don't understand the whole process. So a little bit uh, of what I'm gonna talk about now is six stages of production where there's opportunity for professional uh, uh, audio people to either make money or completely degrade the product at the same time. In fact, at every stage, we're al always facing degradation. And a good engineer is always trying to figure out how not to degrade the product. So if you're working with the right people, they'll tell you, for instance, uh, you're bringing that in, that's a fifth generation CD you're bringing in and you want to master from that to an LP. Now, fifth generation <laughs> CD already sounds bad, but you would be surprised at what people do. They, an artist may not be aware that a copy of a copy of a copy of a CD isn't going to sound very good. And then the record... It's all digital. What are you talking about? <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> there you go. Um, what could possibly go wrong? Well, you know... With the right mastering engineer, they'll actually stop you, and hopefully your producer is informed enough to also stop you. But if, if it's just the artist, or heaven forbid the label, who knows even less about these things, you would be surprised what the labels are sending out. One small example is a, I recorded a, a solo piano record with Vijay Iyer, who's become quite infamous right now. He's top jazz player won the MacArthur Award for his uh, abilities as a young master in his 40s. We recorded this direct to DSD. About two years afterwards, after winning a bunch of awards, the label decided to release vinyl. All they had was 44.1. I knew because I didn't do the mastering for CD, somebody else did. 
They never requested the DSD. That vinyl was made from 44.1. We had the DSD available. It was a very sad day in my life when I realized they released vinyl when they could have put it out from at least the DSD. And they chose to release it from 44.1. So these six stages, the first stage is the recording. That's where you might have, let's just pretend, a basic session drums could include eight microphones, a bass could be anywhere from one to three, additional tracks. If you're doing overdubs, you could have anywhere from 10 to 200 tracks going if you're using a, a PCM system. That's called multi-track. And that multi-track format could be tape, could be PCM, and when you're at PCM, could be all the different sampling rates. It could be DSD, all the different sampling rates. But essentially, it's multi-track. It's not what you're getting at home. It then needs to be mixed, which is the second stage. And at the second stage, the decisions are made for left and right, panning, effects, all kinds of stuff. I'm not going to talk about surround because that's just going to confuse the issue, but the same thing happens in surround. Decisions need to be made. So decisions are made to, for the end product to be two-track stereo, at which point it then goes to mastering, David's area, and in the CD days, he would take all the mixes, line them up with the right amount of space between, editing the top and bottom, fade outs, uh, adjusting gain, some additional EQ to make the songs flow more smoothly. And that same kind of concept is still done today even for downloads, is trying to even things out so you get a smooth experience at home. From Dave, it goes to another stage, whether it's uh, us or HD tracks or an aggregator uh, or even in vinyl, you would uh, take the production tape or used to be you cut directly to the lathe, but you don't, for instance, have a lathe, right, Dave? No. Right. So we'd go uh, to another plant where other decisions are made. Um, and believe me, every converter I've tried sounds different. And then you've got the reseller. For instance, in MP3 world, when, you're, when Dave is done, it goes to an aggregator. That aggregator then sends out to Spotify, to iTunes, to Amazon, at all these other different formats. God knows what happens there. And then the final stage is the delivery. From the delivery to the home, how you're listening to it, whether uh, it, back in the SACD days, it was being converted out PCM, and now that people are listening to DSD, uh, we can actually listen to things in its native DSD rather than being converted to a PCM on the device side. And not to mention the players. Every player will probably play your music differently. So that's a very tough and confusing subject. And I'm going to stop right there, uh, leave this slide up, and I'm going to ask John any yes. questions. Yeah, actually, yeah, I do have questions because, um, okay, so if I go shopping on HD tracks, I'm looking for, say, a, like for example, a new Craig Finn record. Um, I think it's available on HD tracks, but in 2448 or 1648. And I, I see a lot of contemporary rock records that I like that suit my tastes, right? So not the Eagles, a kind of older adult-oriented rock, but kind of more indie rock stuff. And there's a lot of it come, comes out on HD tracks and Kobos, but it's 2441 or 2448. Why, why, why do these, are, w what point does the, the decision get made that we're going to kind of, well, we're just going to stop at 48 kilohertz or 44.1 or 24 bit? What influence is that? Is it just, is it, it seems to be kind of arbitrary. No, it's not arbitrary. Right. It's, it's what's available. Right. If um, a project was mixed to uh, 4824, yeah. which is, is still fairly typical, then um, um, there's really no um, value in up converting that sure. to um, anything higher, NHD tracks considers that um, um, improper. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's uh, fair uh, enough. Know, so, yeah. so, so that's the. the um, so, um, like, the majority of studios 
um, just do they just sort of top out, or the, when, they, when things get mixed, the majority is best was it standard practice 24, 44, 1? Well, um, you know, my, my experience with other engineers and other studios is that um, pretty much everybody wants to do the best possible job that they can right. with what they have. For some people, like Cookie, that's um, gazillion bit, 88 times DSD. <laughs> and for other folks, maybe it's 4424 because that's hmm. how they're set up. So it, it depends. Um, what we get in is a mix, and I'd say half of it is um, 88.2 or 96 kpcm, mm -hmm. smattering of 192, and the rest is uh, 44 or, or 48, 24-bit um, typically. So that seems to mirror that which consumers see on download yeah. sites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, of course, we haven't really kind of touched on the kind of the, the kit, well, the, the more, more important influencer of sound quality here. It's not actually the sample rate and the bit depth. It's what goes on, I guess, on the console or the magic you bring, to David, to the, to the scene rather than just how it's all encoded and wrapped up. I mean, that's just the kind of the bow, really, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, all things being equal, <laughs> which they never are, um, something at 192.24 is probably going to sound better than the CD version, right? right? But the biggest difference is going to be made by the production choices yeah. and the skill of the um, of the players and the engineers and the producer. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, uh, you know, I, I think we all strive to uh, give the best possible experience to the end listener, and um, you know, uh, for me, that's 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 high resolution, whether it's high res PCM or DSD. Um, Right. Fiona, uh, explain a little bit how you record with Will. Uh, Will records in, in 96, and I actually had a question for you about, um, about a friend who recorded with Will a brilliant, brilliant album. And she brought in some files from home, some, some, some backing tracks, because she's also a keyboard artist, so she had you know, some, some pads. Not a lot but enough and they're at 44.1 and she, she took them into the studio and everything else was recorded in 96 and I was trying to help her to get Cookie the 96 files so that she could sell them on Downloads Now and she couldn't because some of those files had gone into the studio at 44.1 so if there's only a few of those layers why couldn't you sell the 96 files? Well that that's a very good question, and it's one of the most confusing. Mm. Being a recording engineer and a mix engineer, in that first stage, as you mentioned, a lot of times, and, and actually this is why a lot of the pop music today you don't find so much in high resolution. I've talked to some of the engineers who work with Beyonce and you know, some of these high-level artists. They're getting, uh, in a similar way, 44.1 from multiple producers. They might get tracks from all over the world, they have to find the default. They'll even get MP3 tracks from unex inexperienced engineers. The default on Pro Tools is 44.1 16-bit. Some engineers, even producers, who are working on these pop records are young and don't even know that there is anything above 44.1 16-bit. So what ends up happening is when you're a mix engineer, you have to get everything into the same format. So what we do is we take those files and we either convert down to the 44.1 or we convert up. So in Will's case, what he may have done is taken those 44.1 files and converted to 96.24 so that he could do overdubs in 96.24. The question becomes, do I sell them in good conscience as 96.24 or do I go through a thorough process of, all right, well, some of the tracks were recorded in 44.1, some were in 96. We decided to, at your discretion, offer this at 96.24, and we'll actually do a listening test. If we feel the 96.24 mix sounds better than the 44.1 or 48, we'll say it, and we let the consumer make the decision. Because those 44.1s, files are technically never going to sound better. Right, okay. Yeah. Dave, is that your experience also? 
Um, sort of. Um, in mastering and mixing too, you know, um, if um, this gets into esoteric stuff, but um, if um, your your um, mix session is forty four twenty four in Pro Tools, but you're mixing um, um, outside of the Pro Tools session, say into a, a high res digital recorder or an analog tape or 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 something, then um, um, just by by doing that, you're you are gaining something, right? I agree. Um, and same with, um, with 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 mastering. I've I've mastered um, projects uh, where the source was um, was DAT tape, but um, because we mastered it in the analog domain, uh, you really do get more something. Uh, so I, I really have no problem um, capturing that, that mastered version back to 9624. And if you look at a spectrogram like the nuts at um, um, everywhere do, they'll say, oh, the frequency response only goes up to 22 kilohertz. So, But um, that doesn't tell the, the whole story. Um, but you know what? As the distributor who gets the calls from those nuts, we have to deal with it. So when we send out a right. 9624 file and the spectro spectrogram mm -hmm. shows 441, and it happened to us last year unknowingly mm -hmm. when we were testing a new converter that actually sounded incredible at 441, we had to take back all the files, resend out files in a format that at least showed, you know, reconvert mm -hmm. it so that the, we didn't have a brick filter that cut off everything at 22. Well, it gets even funnier than than that. Um, not that that's funny. Um, there are our our our, our plugins um, processing um, um, blocks of processing that that uh, you could uh, apply to a track or a mix in 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 in, in Pro Tools. Um, one of them um, that somebody mentioned to me was a um, uh, analog tape emulation program. That sounds really, really good, and a very famous mastering engineer used it. No, he didn't use it. The mix engineer used it um, to create a fabulous sounding mix. Um, turns out that plugin has a filter, so that um, uh, and it's the same filter whether you use it at 44 or 88 or 96. Um, so HD tracks rejected um, that that high resolution. Master, um, I don't know. Um, John? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so g kind of taking it from a con consumer perspective a little bit here. If, if your HD tracks and your, I mean, basically you're selling on the basis of the, of the numbers, right? You're saying this is 2496. So this is, the, this is the language of HD tracks and Kobo's high res downloads. So you're selling by the numbers. So I'm not surprised those nuts, as you call them, run these files through spectrum analyzers just to see whether they're actually getting the genuine deal because, and the reason they, they, they do that is, I think, is because, I mean, what kind of deltas are we talking about here? So the difference between a high res download and a CD. It is not night and day. And in fact, I would suggest that given the, the level of kind of arguments that take place between audio files about whether this one's better or that one's better, it means that it's not certain. So you, you buy an HD tracks download and you kind of go, it's, I think it sounds better. Yeah, it's pretty good. Play the CD. Yeah it's, yeah, it's a bit better here and a bit better there. But gee, I spent 25 bucks on this thing and I could have just streamed it from Tidal already. So the, that my, I'm paying 25 bucks for that tiny delta. You know, I might just run this with a spectrum analyzer just to be sure, you know, and then you're, and because you're being asked to buy on the numbers. And a tiny delta, which isn't always audible, well, isn't always audible. It's not. It's it's debatable in many quarters, right? I'll buy so, that. so your consumers are being asked to spend twenty, twenty-five, sometimes thirty dollars for something that's kind of, you know, not questionable, but like debatable, right? It's. I think that's a tough sell, especially in the age of CD quality streaming. Like, it's, but even in the context of buying a CD from the store. 
like CDs on, Am- on Amazon now, or even from the high street, are like fifteen bucks, twelve bucks. I don't live here, so I'm not. But I, mm. I, I buy a lot of records as well. I might run a digital audio review site, but I got a huge record collection. So if I've got twenty five bucks or thirty bucks to spend, I'm gonna buy the record every time because I get something physical. I don't even care if it's mastered from the CD quality master because it's the... Well, I won't get into all of that, <laughs> but, you know. So I think that HD... Well, high-res downloads are a super tough sell in today's market for all those reasons. So I know I've kind of gone yeah. on a bit of a tear there, you know, so... I'll, I think it depends. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's, there's stuff on HD tracks um, where um, the high-res version... Um, where you really should buy the high-res version. Sure. Um, there's other stuff that's debatable, and it um, has more to do with the production than with the... Um, Absolutely, uh, yeah. Yeah. So if um, you... If, I mean, uh, but if, um, <clears throat> if you want to buy um, a classic jazz album that was um, remastered from the original analog tape, yeah. man, buy the 192.24. Sure. The, um, you know, but yeah. if but if you want to buy a pop thing um, that was mixed from a um, um, hundred track Pro Tools session, well, you know, maybe the uh, final the final resolution doesn't make as as much difference. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I'm the guy that's buying these pop and indie rock, mainly indie yeah. rock things and things like that that do make it to HD tracks and Kobos. Um, and I think because I have a bit of that taste, and then, you know, I'll buy, like I'd steady down and playing through the wall here, you know, I'll buy Gaucho and High Res, and did, I did, because I wanted to hear the differences, but, you know, I love those records as well, but because the, the experience or the delta between that and the CD is inconsistent, so from a consumer's point of view, you kind of buy one, it's really good, you buy the next one, it's like, ah, next one, it's really good, you kind of, you don't have a consistent experience, so again, this is why consumers are kind of, on the back foot a little bit and are very wary and why would they want to talk about provenance and why they want to make sure that they give the numbers reflect what they've bought. They want to just ha- they want to have the checks and balances in place to help them get get past that inconsistent purchasing experience, I think. Well, I'll, I'll give you one of my experiences that fooled me. And I've been doing uh, comparison tests for about 30 years. Um, it's not easy it's not easy to do a real A B test. Obviously, always blindfolded. Uh, I was recently fooled. We had a, a new converter come in. Uh, we tried it out. We were converting our our new DSD two fifty six down to all the other formats, making them available for sale. It sounded incredible. So. When I heard what the conversion sounded like, I didn't really, uh, I listened to the 44.1, I listened to the top end, and then, you know, there's only so much time in a day, I just assumed everything was good. The 44.1 sounded spectacular. In fact, the 44.1 sounded, like, unbelievably good, and I thought, wow, okay. So, day one, we send it out. Uh, It was a good-selling artist. We sold a bunch. Uh, During the, within 24 hours, somebody had run the test on all of them. Everything had the brick wall filter. And what I did after contacting the fellow uh, with the conversion is I had to figure out what had happened. And what he had done was he had made up his mind that in his converter no one heard above (laughs) 44.1. So that was going to be it. Now, how did I get fooled? Because I had a, a method that I had been using very consistently over the years that I was able to identify the different, you know, hear very small differences and teach people how to hear small differences. And what he had done was introduce something I wasn't expecting. And I, I don't know exactly what it is, but what I would call it is a little bit of phase. He somehow threw some phase in there enough that widened the spectrum at 44.1. And it was actually brilliant and scary at the same time. Is that a phase error or just phase correction? He wasn't correcting anything. No, right. he had to be... Well, there's so a lot of filtering that goes on in, in, in software decisions being made. And when you really start talking to these converter manufacturers, for instance, I can t- we downloaded the same piece of music from Acoustic Sounds, from HD Tracks, and we had the music ourselves. And we did a comparison test, and I could tell you that uh, you start to get familiar with the different converter kinds of sounds. Hmm. And you mm-hmm. can start to guess what converter they were using. 
Right. So what this fella with the new converter, and oh, by the way, we ended up, as you said, John, we know our customers are going to look at the numbers. So even though this 44.1 sounded unbelievable, we made the decision to go with the numbers, go back to the old converters, and give our customers the numbers. See, if you were selling content on the basis of, we think this is like a, a subjective rating out of 10, we think this is a 9, and this one's an 8, and if, even if HD Tracks did that, yeah. and priced accordingly to some subjective notion, I think that's an easier sell, because, and, and then it kind of just takes away the, the numbers argument, and, which I think is kind of off-putting anyway, but well, that's a different I think the number stand. argument's gonna go away. But it's going to take a few years because right. people don't really understand the medium. Uh, Fiona, would you like to add something? Well, I, um, I, I had, a, had a different question going in a, a slightly different direction. So, oh, okay. Um, but w what I wanted to ask you was about, and you might be able to answer this and David might be able to as well, is about a different stage that happens after mastering. Um, because I took my 96 files and we went back into the layers and because we did 5.1 surround sound for SACD and you know we reallocated you know, where all the sounds would come from we did this incredible soundscape and you had didgeridoos coming from the back to the to the front and vocals swirling around and that was really cool and, and it was mastered by um, by Bob Ludwig and Bob said I don't do the authoring you have to get authoring done which Gus Skinner did what is authoring David SACD authoring um, actually, ad, um, SACD authoring is really simple. It's basically combining the um, the audio, um, in the case of SACD, the stereo, the 5.1 surround, and if it's a hybrid SACD, the CD layer. It's combining the audio with um, the um, navigation of the SACD, which is really, really simple, and the metadata, um, which is the... Um, the um, text, the, right, the song okay. titles. Um, so SACD authoring is really simple, very little can go wrong. Um, so it's not something that a, ma a, a typical mastering studio would do? It goes to some, some yeah, different uh, place? Yes, uh, and in the case of DVDs and especially Blu-rays, um, it's way more complicated than SACD right. um, ever was because there are so many more options and uh, possibilities for the, um, the uh, resolution of the audio and um, um, uh, the number of audio streams, mm. and, uh, uh, slideshows, video, all this other stuff. So, and, um, and I made um, uh, in the case of SACD, uh, really nothing goes wrong with your, with your um, audio. Um, in the case of Blu-rays, we just finished a, a batch of um, um, Blu-ray stuff, and I'm waiting for the uh, check discs to make sure that. Yeah, that I, I made the mistake fine. of not paying for the optional. Do you want to check all your files before we um, manufacture your SACD? Because I thought, okay, I've gone through all these processes, I've done all the right things, and it came back with three little blips in the stereo layer of the SACD from from well. Austria from the manufacturing plant so that was a mistake that I made was not just you go through all of that you pay all that money you know you do the best job that you can do and then you just think well look I won't take the $300 option because surely somebody in there sits and listens to this and they didn't yeah and a problem like that could be um, could have come um, at the mastering stage it could have come at the authoring stage or the manufacturing stage and so yeah. Um, you know, due diligence is really required. You have to check things yeah. at every Yeah, so I've every learned my lesson on that one. I Try. mean, I was going to say, because I, I, if, if, if people are just kind of doing jobs, they're, I don't know, layering um, all the files out for authoring for different disc media, I mean, they may just... It might just be the nine to five job for them. And I think from what I gather, a lot of guys in the industry don't care about sound quality. This is just a job, right? So they're just pro going through a yeah. process with, with each thing. And to assume that every single person that touches your work is really going to be care about it and you know, love Unless it and nurse through. it through, I think I won't say it's not it's not naive because you, that was that sounds like well, criticism, I was, but you know, clearly, yeah, but you know, I think if you, it's basically if you want something done well, do yeah. it yourself, right, and just yeah. check it at every stage because yeah. it shouldn't change at authoring yeah. at all. But that's not an uncommon problem. I've seen you know, DVDs from, you know, really big artists and they've got all sorts of chaptering problems and things like that. They don't even check them. So, 
Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, check, I've, check, uh, check, and check. Again. So you've got audible glitches in, in, in your in your essay. There was two, two, yeah, two little right. little glitches. Yeah, and that's just so you know, the the Blue Coast collection, which David mastered, I've gotten. Uh, we've had remanufactured at Sony, the same place, three times. Every test disc has been different when we receive it. Wow. Yeah, I know, stunned. Yeah, and, and And this is something that m most of the consumers aren't aware of. In fact, the very first one was the best. None of them have sounded as good as the first one. Really? Really. And in fact, the first one was one that came back with a glitch. Remember, Dave, and we couldn't find it because the glitch only appeared on one out of ten machines. And we had to remaster yeah. it. And I did pay for that $300. And then Sony, when I said it doesn't sound the same, wanted me to pay another $1,800 to find out what the problem was. Mm -hmm. And that was just like, I was so mad. I wasn't, I said, that's it. I'm not starting a record label. But then uh, a year later, I just changed my mind. Yeah. And what Could, was I thinking? Can John? I ask a much broader question? May I ask a much broader question? You talk about consumers, right? So consumers for HD tracks and, and say DSD downloads, acoustic sounds, your, your site. Uh, who, who are those consumers? Who do you think they are? Well, I mean, uh, could you describe them? What the demographic is, and because uh, I'm, uh, you wondering? Uh, yeah, I'm wondering. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, our customer, because we actually uh, sell downloads around the world. Mm -hmm. Eighty percent are outside of the United States. Uh, ninety-nine point nine 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 nine. I think one out of ten thousand is a woman. That means mostly men. Uh, Actually, worldwide, we have a, a younger audience starting at about 25, um, and, and between 30 and 40, it's pretty good. But the majority of the audience is over 40, mm -hmm. uh, no kids in the house, and Lucky. earn a fairly decent living or are retired. Right. Now, a lot of them aren't unbelievably wealthy. In fact, outside of the United States, we actually have college students who save up all their money for a, a $50 download. Yeah. I mean, do you think the market for downloads is growing or shrinking? I think it's plateaued right now. I think right. we've kind of found it. And do you think that it has been affected at all by Deezer's CD quality streaming and, and Tidal CD quality streaming? Do you think that's having an influence? I, I would expect you yeah. would. I think what's having the most effect is just all the chatter around it. Right. And I think what's happened, especially what I noticed was after Apple Music debuted really with um, uh, some disappointment in the way they handled it. Like people who were passionate music lovers ended up having their entire collections destroyed. Yeah. People who had spent endless hours marking five different takes and because it had the same title ended up getting wiped out. Those people were very disappointed. Hmm. And then Apple put the blame back. Apple was dealing with a mainstream audience that, and they didn't understand the passionate fan. So um, what, I, what I started noticing over the last year was the more talk about Tidal with Jay-Z, more talk about Spotify from uh, Taylor Swift, more talk about Apple Music, and everybody sort of forgot about the high-res downloads and went said, you know what, this is way too confusing. I'm going back to vinyl. Well, that's the thing. I mean, the, 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 the technical chatter for people that are not in the audiophile world is, I think, outrageously off-putting. And you're right. They just walk away and go, stuff all this. This is just a mess. And like we talk about it all the time. And like, we've been talking about numbers at the start of this session. And if some of my non-audiophile mates were in here, they'd be like, what are you talking Who are you, John? You know, like, what, what are you talking about? We just want to, we want to get like a, a magazine album, you know, a, and some, some television or something like that. And this is what you know, we, we the, the conversation that Cookie and I had at, in Newport was that I said to Cookie, I don't buy anything from your site, not because I'm not interested in getting the best quality, but because you don't sell music that I like. And for me, and that's not, I'm, that's not enough, I wasn't trying I to like be offensive, it. but it's just, it's, for me, my music purchases and what I play at home is no, in no way determined primarily by the, the delivery format. I play the... I, think, well, what do I want to play? play maybe, maybe I play some David Bowie. And then I'll go, right, okay, I've got five versions. I'm pretty nerdy with Bowie, actually. I've got five versions of low, different CD masters and things like that, and an SA CD rip from the net from God knows where. Um, and then I choose which one. 
you know, but I won't let the tail wag back the dog. I won't go, today I'm going to listen to some DSD because it sounds real good. I, j- I find that mindset bizarre. But that is a lot of our customers. Yeah, that's in it. Fact, yeah, yeah. All of our, when I was trying to sell in the normal traditional fashion, when I first started in, t- in the United States, traditional distribution, the first question that's ever asked of me is, name one of your artists. Do I know any of them? No, you don't. But now, that's a reasonable question to ask, though, right, from a consumer's <laughs> point of view, yeah. no one asked outside of the United States. And so when I started focusing around the, uh, outside of the United States, people actually listened to the music and right. made their decisions based on whether they liked the music. Now, ah, thanks. Um, so granted, what we've done is focused on a very kind of curated sound. We're not, we can't deal with the majors. Another thing you, you guys should know, it's not that easy to do licensing with the majors. And then you have country restrictions. There's yeah. a lot of reasons why we don't carry it. And, and that's fine. You know, we understand that. We're gonna focus on the customers who like what we do and we're gonna stay focused with that. And you've got a really cool brand thing going. Um, when I was younger and I discovered um, ECM records, um, I would buy almost every ECM record that came out until I couldn't afford it anymore. And, well, they were my uh, model. Uh, and it didn't matter who the artist was. Um, Wyndham Hill was the same way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. ECM. And those were also my models because you didn't question. You knew there was a certain aesthetic and sound that was going to be very consistent. And so you, you aligned with the brand rather than the artist. And from a, a label standpoint, it's a little easier too because you never know when an artist is going to have a baby, stop touring, something happens, and they're they're suddenly gone. So you've made a huge investment in promoting an artist, and they're not there. If you promote the brand, they also benefit. The newer artists benefit from the brand's notoriety. So that was the path we took because we didn't have the funding for millions of dollars in promotion. Now I, I want to just see where we are here. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to open it up to some. Anybody have any questions? No, okay, we'll, we'll just keep talking. Yep. Oh. So, as consumers, how can we um, be sure of what we're buying? Should we just wait? Can we just wait for a microphone for this gentleman? You know, or we can repeat the question. Yeah. We do that in the studio all the time. <laughs> testing, testing. Oh. Well, um, I'm a consumer, and I want to know that um, how can we be sure of what we're buying today? You mean the, in terms of provenance? Well, and like, like, I mean, if I buy a high res, it's actually uh, it's worth the money. Of, it's worth that price. Of well, and I think quality. what you're talking about is understanding the provenance. And right now, we're in murky waters. Um, it's very hard to tell, even though I know HD tracks and acoustic sounds are try to be as careful as they can. Realistically, unless you're making phone calls and you talk to 100 people involved in the chain of recording, you don't really know. I, I'm not going to say who or what, but I know a very famous band that was selling 192 downloads, and I was at those sessions, they were not 192 sessions. Now, whether the, how much investigation you're going to do to uh, you know, uh, uh, prove the provenance is something else. We're hoping that there'll be a system where, on our site, for instance, we disclose as much as we can. We interview the engineers, the people involved. We try to do as much research as we can, which is why that one artist that uh, Fiona was mentioning, we had to say no, because we actually went back, it was three weeks of work for the engineer to go back and research the original files and come back with, sorry, Cookie, it was 44.1. But But how many people are gonna invest that kind of time? Well, I'll just tell one story. Um, um, On some some Grateful Dead stuff that we did uh, for um, Rhino, which is Warner Brothers, concert um, recording re, uh, remastered. Um, everything was mastered at 192. Um, I get a report back from the Warner Brothers quality control department and say, well, um, at three minutes and 24 seconds of this track, um, it looks like the sample rate goes to 
144 for 18 seconds and then back up to 192. Can you comment? And the um, comment was, well, yeah, because we had to do a little patch where they changed tapes um, on, on the original session, and it's cool. Um, so um, uh, anything from Warner Brothers that's available, I'm assuming, goes through the same kind of quality control thing. So you could be sure you know, that, um, that, it's, that it's cool. If you're buying 96K thing, then, then it's real. I don't know if that's true with all the labels, though. Um, I have no idea. I, uh, that's just my one uh, data point. The, the um, for instance, the Warner Brother fire that happened—I don't know, five or six years ago in in London. That was Universal. Universal. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Universal fire annihilated a lot of the original masters, and what only is left now is 9624. And there's some people who are very honest about what they're trying to do, literally trying to make vinyl who are always making vinyl from tape, cannot get to the tape originally mixed to tape, but all they can get is the 9624. So I think more and more people, uh, or more and more distributors are starting to realize the consumer wants to know this. Not all, maybe 5%, but those 5% are the people who care and are gonna come back, and we need to be more diligent about but, but, that provenance. But this is what I'm talking about in terms of like mastering, inconsistent, mastering quality inconsistency, provenance management inconsistency and the consumer understandably just kind of throws a hand up in the air and goes I just don't know where I stand with any of this because this one was good this one was bad this one had you know showed you know spectra the spectrograph showed it roll off at 22 and a 0 0.05 and it's just such a pain in the ass for the money that is being spent you know I, I, we can't ignore that this this I mean 25 bucks an album in today's um, society is a lot of cash, you know, and we can really get into the argument about how the, the um, music industry has slowly devalued music over the last 10 years to the point where it's almost worth nothing. And there's a great mm. article on Pitchfork about this, yeah. about how music today is worth zilch to many people. Mm. Cookie, I have a, na a very naive question. Yeah, sure. Because I don't buy downloads. I, I like the physical thing. Um, you could audition um, like a, a little snippet of things before you download it, right, on most sites. Can, yeah. Can you, you not? Mostly at MP3. Oh, and it's okay. usually really bad MP3, like 128. <laughs> so you don't know what you're getting anyway. Uh, we've started, yeah, it's, so you can't really take that snippet and run it through. It's going to be MP3 and bad sounding, 30 seconds, cut it off. So you I, can't really make any any informed judgment from that. Right. I okay. mean, I think all of us agree that the best production comes from the microphone, the artist, the source. And what we're talking about is, you know, it, we hope that it's a musical decision, but when you do want the, you're a fan of that particular track, you want the best, you just want to know what happened. Yeah, but essentially the consumer doesn't know what they've got until they've paid the money and downloaded it and gone, right, what is this? And then mm -hmm. it's good. I, they either kind of make a call, it's either good or bad yeah. or it's okay, you know? But money is spent and then you have to go chasing HD tracks after the fact. I'm not, I'm not singling out HD tracks, it could be Kobo's or anybody right. else. After the fact for a refund or for comment or, yeah. it's a pain. I'm hoping that some kind of system uh, comes up like a, a LinkedIn system where people can actually, like you said, vote up and down their experience. I'll give you a good example of this actually. This, on, uh, this is HD tracks. Talking Heads Remain in Light. One of the all-time great albums of the 80s. All-time great albums of the 80s. What am I talking about? One of the great albums of the 80s. And I, HD tracks, you download it. It's not... A, it, it's actually a, a direct mix-down of the 5.1 version. I only know this because, I'm again, I'm a Talking Heads nerd. I've mentioned this to David Chesky in person. He's like, well, just email our team and we'll, we'll look into it. And yet, three years later, four years later, it's still there. So, and they'll just say it's, it's what's handed to us by, I think in that case, it's Warner Brothers. And you can understand, you can, I can understand the argument, they're just passing on to the consumer what they give, but again, it doesn't make the consumer's life any easier. No, we, it, we've got a question at the back, oh, yeah, I think. Chris. Mr. Conacher's uh, con copy the microphone. Test. Okay, um, I, I kinda wanna get your guys' take on it. The, for the most part, at least to me and a lot of people, the numbers don't mean anything when it comes to quality. It's more about the people. Like, you know, if Doug Sachs mastered it, I want to buy that. It's his brand. It's, and if Joe Sixpack mastered it at 
32, 384, I don't really care. What about trying to focus more on the, the people who do it and the artists who care about it instead of really pushing the numbers? <laughs> well, I, I, th- I think you. we really should. I think we do. And, and being that you have a, a lively forum, you could even lead that <laughs> charge because I, think the f- I, I totally agree, and I think all of us do. In fact, Dave and I have already lived through this experience when uh, in the days of going from final to CD and we had to deal with the AAD days, we were doing the same thing, only now it's 10 times more complicated. So what happens? Nobody's using AAD anymore, or ADD, whatever they wanted to do. We're not identifying an analog, digital, digital master anymore. That went away because nobody cared. It went back to the music. I think the same thing will happen, but we do need to get off the focus and maybe train people to what an original, what the music, go back to the music and what the music sounds like, how it was recorded, who is recording it, what the art, who the artist is, and their choices. Um, can I just say, as, as artists, the, um, David touched on this, the only way that we have to promote our music, um, and I do this all the time with, with my album that, that Cookie um, produced, it, we, we promote on Facebook, we, we, we're using um, YouTube links, we're sending people to, you know, to CD Baby, to all sorts of places, and they're listening to really, really low quality files. And that's, that's how we promote our music, because they can't be listening to the high quality files. So how, how, do we, how do we do that? How do we get people to listen first to samples of exactly what they're gonna buy? Well, we can't, we've got no way of doing that. I think the majority of the people don't care. I mean, not, I'm not saying audiophiles, but I'm talking about the whole, if you look at the whole of mainstream, I think they are, they're more inclined to listen on YouTube. I listen on YouTube. And you could yeah, put I a listen fairly... listen on YouTube, but it's, you're listening to r- right. half the time. I think you're right. I don't think they care at all. But, but, that's, but that's not because they don't care, care. It's because convenience will always trump quality. And this is one thing that But we're I trying think, to sell quality. Yeah, for sure. We've got no way of selling it, of, of but the reason, people test it. The reason, I, the reason I think that CDs did so well in the 80s was because they were sold as much on convenience and being indestructible and as the sound quality, yeah, you get crystal clear sound, but this thing's going to last forever and you can throw it around the room and you can spread jam on it and all that kind of stuff. So the convenience factor, and the same with the streaming world, the convenience factor is what wins people over. So I think what you need to be able to do is, is maintain that convenience, but then slipstream in somehow invisibly, high, you know, high, higher quality streaming. Unfortunately, at the moment, like, a lot of people won't even pay the 20 bucks for CD quality title when the, the lossy version, they go, oh, 20 bucks, it's way too much, way too much, which is, I find bizarre. But that's just the way the industry, I think, has gone. It's really, really quite depressing. So then yeah, you kind of I, ask them. I feel like I've got a, f- a foot in both camps because I've got my CD, MP3 releases, and then I've got the stuff I do with Cookie, which is the audio file stuff. And you asked the question earlier about um, commercial uh, reality. Mm. I- in this camp, the MP3 CD sales, they're zero. People are not paying. I mean, I'm not, the sales have just gone right down. Right. The sales in this world are increasing. So in this world, we've gone to, to, to the access model, which is the streaming, and in this world, people can only get it if they pay for it. So this is the world to, to concentrate on. Uh, y- you know, it, oh, yes. So you, you keep mentioning the access model versus the, the pay model, but I mean, I went to pure streaming, and I did it less out of not wanting to own music and more out of not wanting to organize my music. It's a lot more convenient for me to use Tidal because I can just f- pull up my phone. If I want to check out a new artist, I check out the new artist. And I've, I've honestly stopped buying music because I don't want to sit there at my computer so I can have it on my phone and rip it myself or even buying files. I don't want to sit there and manage my files and all of these folders. And I, I, before I switched to streaming, I was spending hours mm. doing hmm. this. Yeah, I I understand that, but somehow or other, it doesn't relate back to paying the artists. Um, And I'll give you an example. The the problem problem. isn't the streaming model. The problem is that the streaming services we have today are being driven by consumers that don't think it's valuable. Yeah. No, they're being they're being driven by executives who don't think the music's valuable. It's being driven by leeches who see all this 
content out there that they can monetize for themselves. Yeah. That's okay. the problem. Yeah. But um, even like with, with Tidal, I know Tidal does pay more to their artists, and that's actually one of the reasons I do pay Tidal. That's actually one of the reasons. Thank you. <laughs> that, that's one of the reasons that I go for the $20. I mean, I do like the hi-fi, but even if I'm, if I'm streaming 320 I would rather pay for Tidal over Spotify because I know Tidal pays the artist better. How do you and know? Have you ever seen a contract? I no. have. Well, that's yeah. That, that's but I, I, I watch the news, and if I, I, I watch consumer reports, and I, I, I keep an eye on a lot of different sources, and there's, I don't know for sure, but I know the big thing I know is that I know Spotify pays garbage. So Tidal do pay more per stream to record companies. And then the, uh, how much the artist sees thereafter is dependent upon the contract between the artist and the record company or the distribution no, company. No, I, I wouldn't even right. say that. I've seen both contracts. Right. And the contract I read, Yeah. Uh, it's, this might be hard to understand. So it's basically you take all the music on there and what it sells, divide it by all the artists on there. Spotify then pays out... 70% to the label or the artist. Yeah. Same deal with Tidal, only in my contract, it was paying out 50%. Interesting. Yeah. Now, it could be that because Tidal has a smaller base that you might get more, and I'm going to find out next month when my royalty statement comes in because we ran a little test. Oh, by the way, I got banned on, one of my songs got banned on Spotify because yeah, I, I had an in infinite Spotify repeat. Either. I can't get it. it. Won't let me in either. No, we, d we did a little test. We did a little test, band. and we did a couple of infinite repeats to see what we what yeah. would happen. And so I'll see what those royalties are. But I can tell you now that what Spotify has been paying out is point zero 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 three five cents hmm. per stream, and it doesn't matter if a fifty second song or a five minute song, it's the same payout. So I'm going to find out about Tidal. And I have asked a lot of artists and labels, and nobody could really give me this uh, answer. I haven't seen anybody else's royalty on statement. So, so yeah. you need a whole lot of one minute <laughs> We've talked about that. Okay. That you're going to see a lot more of that from artists, too. A lot shorter songs, play them fast, and get them off. I suspect that. Oh, no, 100 one minute songs. Related to this um, uh, is the broadcast side. I just want to mention real, real quick. Um, Naris, uh, the Grammy people, um, have worked with uh, other um, stakeholders in the music um, um, business uh, <coughs> to promote two bills that are before Congress. One is the Fair Play, Fair Pay Act, and it covers broadcast. Um, broadcast stations, over-the-air broadcast stations, don't pay the kind of royalties that um, streaming services do. Um, they pay um, publishing to ASCAP and um, BMI, but not, uh, but they don't pay performance royalties. Um, Oct on October 14th, um, Naris um, is um, fanning out across the country to um, um, representatives from Congress to uh, talk to the um, members of Congress about the Fair Play, Fair, Fair Play, Fair Pay Act to encourage its, its passage. And the other act is the AMP Act, which will include um, producers as one of the um, uh, parties eligible for Royalties. So, um, if any of you are in Congress, uh, you know, vote vote for it. And if you know any Congress people, you know that's a um, it's a worthy thing. That's, mm. you know, that's so we're going to have to wind down. But I'm going to let John finish. Thank, well, I was just going to suggest I don't know anybody anybody's seen this um, report that came out about six months ago um, from from Berkeley, the Rethink Music Report on streaming services in the industry. Um, it's it, it's incredible reading if you've got a, it takes about an hour to get through it but there's some great infographics in there that show basically the flow of the money it's it's like a it's like a gangster movie follow the money and this report follows the money from your streaming uh, monthly payment all the way back to the artist in several different scenarios across several different services it's really 
powerful, powerful stuff. What and am I talking about? But you know what I mean? Like, it's potent stuff. The last thing I want to add about that is they don't add that the uh, labels actually own 15% of Spotify. And so when it IPOs, the labels are going to get money that never has to go back to the artist. And I want to thank you all for coming because this has been a very lively, interesting thank you. discussion. <laughs> thank you. And thank all the panelists.